Hey, good morning. Um, before we start, I just want to let everyone know that this panel is going to be recorded and it's being recorded at the moment. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Roberto Martinez Maldonado and I have the honor to moderate this panel on this exciting topic, human-centered AI in education with our four expert speakers. I'm going to introduce in a minute. But before we dive into it, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am today, the Panoram people, and the traditional owners of the lands where you all are at the moment. And I believe this is really important. And I wanted to start this, this panel with this piece of art uh, that represents the ultimate aim of what we want to to discuss today, which is creating AI, creating uh, robots, creating automated agents that serve us, especially and particularly in, in education that serve teachers and that serve uh, students. And more specifically, um, we invited a set of expert speakers. They're going to share their experiences working closely with educational stakeholders at various levels from K-12 to higher education to create data-informed practices and also enabling technologies. And with enabling technologies, we are talking about learn analytics, about educational data mining, innovations, artificial intelligence in education uh, tools as well. And I have the, the honor to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Brownwin Combo from Monash University. And she has ample experience in applying participatory design methods to understand um, how um, we envisage the uses of data in schools. We also have Dr. Vanessa Echeverria, also from Monash University, but bringing a more computer science perspective as she has been uh, also utilizing co-design techniques to develop multimodal learning analytics in higher education. Our third speaker is Dr. Selena Fisk. She is a data storyteller, storyteller and author, and she's been working with several organizations, including schools and other educational providers to create the strategic approaches to data. And she is also um, has been applying the, the emerging paradigm of data storytelling. And finally, we have Dr. Lisa Angelique Lim, uh, who has also been working in uh, using human-centered AI to design um, uh, in learning analytics innovations in higher education, and she's coming from UTS. The agenda for this panel is very simple. We're going to start with uh, a couple of questions, and we are going to, to hear from the experts on their perspectives on, on this uh, idea of human-centered AI or human-centered analytics in education based on their current works. And they're gonna have a five minute speech to, to tell us about their perspectives. And next we have, um, they're gonna discuss about current limitations in this area and also potential future directions. And we're going to end up with a Q&A. So if you have any question, can you please put it in the Vuva platform? and we're going to go through those questions afterwards. So without any further preamble, I just want to start with the first question, which is what is human-centered AI or learn analytics in education? I'm just gonna stop my share, share my screen and I'm going to pass the button to Brownie. Thank you, Roberto. Okay, let's see what we do here. Okay, are you seeing the right screen there? I hope so. Um, thanks, Roberto. My name is Brahman Kumbo. Um, I'm going to illustrate my thoughts around this question of what is human-centered AI in education by describing a part of the Data Smart Schools in I, um, project that I've been working on with Neil Selwyn and Lucy Pangratzke over the last three years. It's an ARC-funded project. And we're a team of social researchers. So Neil and Lucy's research sits within the realm of critical data studies and science and technology studies. 
And my work really looks at participatory design and future possibilities in HCI. So this project focused on the human experience of data in secondary schools. And we then worked with schools to co-design ways to support them do data differently. So our research was carried out in three secondary schools in Melbourne, a public school, a Catholic school, and an independent school. And within each school, we carried out a series of interviews and focus groups with teachers, students, and administrative staff to understand their data practices, platforms, and data aspirations before moving on to the co-design phase. So I'm gonna focus on the students and what they said about school data, as this is an often overlooked component of the data discourse. So firstly, students felt that data was a pervasive part of their school life. They recognized that the school collected the usual types of data on them, grades, how naughty they are, their reports, timetable. However, the students had a keen sense of data being used to monitor or track them, or track them across websites. So a few students mentioned being tracked when they were in classroom via a platform that let the teacher know whether they were on track or not, depending on the various website they were on. And this, had, um, this came with questionable accuracy. Other students mentioned that if the teacher could see they were logged into the school system from home in the evening, that the teacher would assume that they hadn't been concentrating in class during the day. So whether this is true or not is really beside the point. The main message is that students carry with them this feeling of being trapped, which cultivates a sense of distrust between them and their teacher and has the power to change how they feel about school and learning. Another key issue that came out was that this tracking does not end when kids leave the school. Several students thought that school could see that, that the school could see their personal searches on the internet, even when they're at home. So it wasn't surprising that some students thought that this tracking could continue well into the future. So it would influence future university or job applications. Again, this isn't the case. Um, we have laws in place to protect student privacy, but this is what the students believed. Interestingly, students had diverse opinions on data privacy in schools. So one group of students were distrustful of personal data platforms, so social media platforms or Google, but trusted that the school platforms would keep their data private. A second group of students expressed that, that whilst they didn't trust what personal platforms did with their data, so their social media sites, for instance, they were able to use strategies to keep their data safe. Many used a fake name, entered a false birth date, they believed that passwords were key to privacy and data protection, and these issues were the responsibility of the user. But when it came to school data, the students weren't afforded this type of agency over their data privacy. Students expect, expressed that at school they were users of digital media who knew little about who or what was interested in their data and how it was being used. This really speaks to the next point around the role of ed tech firms in schools. So students thought that these ed tech firms were probably accessing their data and were curious about why and how it was being used. Others were more cynical. For instance, students from a Google school understood that Google was accessing their data, but didn't feel they had any control over this. There was also a large group of students who hadn't thought about the role of ed tech firms at all and the relationship between these firms and their school. We asked the students about personalised learning and how data was used to support them understand how they were going in various subjects. So for many students, this was merely a monitoring exercise. They could use data to see their ranking or their grade or areas they needed to improve. And in some contexts, this was used as a conversation starter between the student and the teacher. However, for the most part, students didn't feel empowered to use their data constructively. They also didn't feel the data accurately represented who they were as students. So if, for instance, the school profile was often raised as an example where students were inaccurately represented by the data and they couldn't do anything about this. Finally, when asked about how the school could do data differently, the overarching method, uh, message for students was that they wanted data to be used to help them learn and to shift the focus away from tracking, monitoring and surveillance practices. And so this has quite a few implications for how we do data differently in schools, which I'll talk to in the next part of the panel. Thank you. I'm just gonna pass the microphone to Vanessa. Yep. I will start sharing my screen. Okay. 
Thank you, Heather. So Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Cool. Okay, so um it was an awesome presentation from Rowan. I love the comic strips, how she explained the part of a human centered AI. It was really provoking. So but I would like to present this part of human centered learning analytics perspective uh, in the roots of um, human centered AI. So, in a general vision, this is taken from Ben Snyderman's perspective on human centered AI. He mentioned that it is basically an expansion from an algorithm focused view to embrace a human centered perspective to better serve human needs, which is basically in line with, uh, with the key message from the past presentation. And as many technology companies has been saying that the goal is not to replace people, but to empower them by making design choices that give human control over technology. With this slide, I would like to um, say that it is not just about like, how do we center a AI into our daily lives, but it is how do we design these technologies with human values in mind. It's like blending the technology, the human and ethics in one shared space. In an educational context um, taken from human centered learning analytics uh, um, from Professor Buckingham Sean Ferguson and Martinez Maldonado, they express that basically the design of effective learning analytics extends beyond some technical and pedagogical principles. We should design with the human, with the learners, with teachers in mind. So the design process needs to take into account a range of human factors. And what do we mean by human factors? It is about the uh, students and teachers' ideas, their freedom to express themselves, to put their insights into the technologies that we are developing. Having this equality in mind, their feelings, the, and also part of the data pro protection and privacy. So in this human-centered approach, the people is the center of the whole problem solving process. Talking about learning analytics, which is basically the focus of my research, uh, this is a big picture of the cycle uh, of how we develop learning analytics solutions. We have the learners in which we can capture interaction data. We have different, different techniques and, for example, visualizations. So we allow learners to interpret the, their data um, in order to predict, intervene, recommend personalized learning. And we also have these different stakeholders. I want to present one example of the research that uh, we have been doing with uh, my awesome research team, uh, what we call human-centered teamwork analytics. This is in the context of nursing education in which nurses uh, are providing uh, support to a patient, like a fake patient. So we start to capturing different uh, behaviors from the team in this simulation lab scenario. So in this work, we propose this Tingware Analytics infrastructure in which um, we can actually uh, add ideas from stakeholders. We provide different inputs into this computational system from stakeholders, which this could be educators, team researchers, experts, um, task designers. And then with all these computational technologies, we want to provide meaningful information for sense making. In this infrastructure, uh, we provide uh, two well, we provide like uh, three main uh, characteristics, which is like hybrid human machine team sensing in which we are not only using uh, data 
from multiple sensors, but also we are using human as a sensors. So we are providing with a user interfaces to capture a human um, log data in order to provide context. We are also providing a way to capture and coding data into meaningful higher order team constructs. So basically it is not just raw data, but now we are providing meaningful data into this computational model. And finally, we are also providing um, an expert driven storytelling engine in which we want to visualize meaningful information by using info visualization, data storytelling techniques in order to provide meaningful feedback. Because we know that multimodal data, it's complex to provide at glance, but we want to excavate that uh, sense making. And of course, we try to listen to our teachers and students by uh, developing and using different code design techniques such as idea generations and also these studying journeys. So this is my view of human-centered teamwork analytics and I will be more than happy to keep discussing this topic with the rest of the panelists. Yeah. You, Vanessa, and what a better way to transition to Selena. Uh, you were mentioning um, that storytelling. So Selena, please enlighten us. Awesome. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, I really love that quote that Vanessa shared around it's human centered perspectives that better serve human needs. And my, I guess, experience and contribution to this conversation is probably quite different to um, the other three people here because I am a data storyteller, I'm a grounded researcher. And what that means for me is on a day to day basis, I'm working in schools with teachers and school leaders around the ways that they actually use and harness the great data that they've got access to. So for me, um, the work that I do, I focus on as a data storyteller, I guess, teachers and leaders being able to um, kind of move through these different stages. Obviously, if we want people actually being able to access and use the data so that it's um, benefiting young people and benefiting students, we need them to understand the data in the first place. So data literacy is important. In terms of the human-centered AI, you know, I do a lot of work with schools around the idea of what good data visualizations are and, and what I guess I I get to see on a daily basis is that there's often a lot of assumptions about people's capacity to actually engage with some of those visualizations in the first place, um, which is a challenge and which can be pretty problematic um, if we're asking them to use the data to inform teaching and learning, but they can't necessarily or find it difficult to interpret the visualizations to begin with. For me, the goal is obviously data storytelling. And um, when I work with educators, I talk to them about data storytelling helping to answer these two key questions. So what does the data tell me about my young people? So what are the insights that I'm gleaning from the data? And then once I've got those insights, what do I actually do about them? What do I do in my classroom? What do I do across my team? What does that look like? And how am I shifting teaching and learning? Um, so that all of this analysis and work and data collection is actually benefiting young people. So the challenge that I guess I see with um, human-centered AI is that, as I said, there's, there's often assumptions about people being able to read and interpret the visualizations in the technology that people have got access to. So when they struggle to identify insights in the first place, we can't get them to the point where they're thinking about action. So there's certainly a real need for me to work with um, educators to and tech companies to think about, well, how do we actually build and design products that enable these insights to really um, be more obvious to people? So a lot of the times in these conversations, we talk about the element of automation and the importance of automation in almost flagging insights and, and key kind of trends in the data to teachers by literally putting them into their email inboxes. Because what we know, we, we want data-informed teachers and school communities, but we also know that teachers are incredibly time poor and 
you know, there's also a lot of people for whom data is not their first language. Um, they're not super comfortable with it, uh, but there are potentially new insights and things coming out every day. Um, and for many schools, that's happening across a whole stack of different um, platforms and different dashboards. So for me, a really effective human-centered AI in schools when it's working really well is it's going to be able to help teachers cut down the time that it takes for them to identify the insights. It automates it, puts it in their email inbox. So they, uh, I guess, uh, their attention is drawn to things that they may have not identified otherwise, or they may not have had time to actually go into the dashboard to investigate because the goal and the focus has absolutely got to be getting teachers and educators to the point where they're thinking, if they're the insights, what do we actually do about it? Um, and one of the things I often say is that, you know, it's humans, it's young people that are generating all of this data for us. As humans, we're the ones doing a lot of the analysis and interpretation. And at the end of the day, it's got to be humans that are benefiting from all of that work that we're doing. Um, so that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. And, and now I'm going to pass the microphone to Lisa. Thank you, Roberto, and uh, really appreciate the, the presentations that have gone before. So I'm going to draw on a couple of them, um, especially um, echoing uh, what Bronwyn, sorry, uh, that uh, Selena has mentioned about um, uh, what Vanessa shared, that the quote around the, the human center is really about uh, putting the human in the center. So I just want to give a little bit of background about my <clears throat> myself. Um, I work at the Connected Intelligence Center, where the remit is really to connect AI and learning analytics tools with practitioners in a human-centered way. So I mainly work with um, learning analytics uh, tools. And I, um, um, so when I think about human-centeredness, um, what I think about is really the agency and co-design. So I'll talk about um, this very briefly with reference to one of the learning analytics tools that I'm supporting academics with at UTS. So the tool that I've been spending a lot of time with um, is on task. So let me just put a little link in the chat for a quick, um, so that you can quickly see what that's about. Um, so OnTask, if you're not aware, is a tool that facilitates um, personalized communication and feedback at scale. It's really a human in the loop system that gives agency to the academic in a number of ways, uh, such as the selection of data for use in interventions, in the algorithms or rules that inform the personalization of feedback, as well as the, the, the actual intervention, which is the message that goes out to students. So where does the code, so that was the agency, where does the core design come in? So whenever I consult with academics uh, about designing their personalized feedback with on task in their subjects, um, I usually have a short list of questions, just like Selena, um, just a few more than two questions, but really uh, the first question I ask is, what is your main purpose for using this tool in your subject? Because identifying this purpose helps to anchor the design of personalized feedback within the specific context. The purpose could be something like um, wanting to keep students consistently engaged or building a sense of belonging in the subject. So, um, for example, let's say the academic's use of on task is to keep students engaged. So this means that we need, you know, like regular, we need to build in regular personalized nudges. And so we will work together to design for that uh, in, the, in, the, in the subject. So how does agency look like in terms of for the students? So for students, it's really ensuring there's transparency in the use of their data, uh, giving them the opportunity to reflect on their learning, and then it's uh, leaving them to decide on how to act on any feedback or recommendation. And as part of that agency, students can also continue the feedback dialogue with the academic because the academic has basically opened up a channel of communication that um, for the students. So I'll just, um, just end off to say that learning is learning is complex. So it's not like physical trackers where, you know, if your goal is 10,000 steps in the day, you just need to reach 10,000 steps in the day. Uh, learning, as we know, involves the orchestration of so many individual and environmental factors. Um, and so ultimately, I take the position that AI in education should be to augment human intelligence. And that puts the human in the center of AI. So in the end, when the tool is, uh, when a human-centered uh, learning analytics or AI tool is used well, it's really purposeful for the educator, firstly, and secondly, it's meaningful for the student. 
Thank you for the first round of responses to this fuzzy topic. And we can see that there are some questions already there in the chat. Um, so we are going to flow into our second question before we dive into Q&A from the audience. Second question is about the current limitations that are seen by our different speakers in this area of human-centered AI in education. And also the, these limitations can point at, at potential future directions. So we're going to start again with Renwi. Thanks, Roberto. Okay. So I'm gonna look at this question through the lens of the Data Smart Schools project again, and five recommendations that came out of the research we did with the students. So some of these have been linked, uh, are linked with the points that have come up from the other three panels already, which is wonderful. Um, so the first recommendation is to really address issues of data privacy when using these data platforms in schools. So in our research, we noticed that all three schools we were working in had purchased and were using a range of different platforms for storing and analyzing data in various ways. So this included the school learning management system, classroom surveillance platforms, the Google Suite, timetabling platforms, platforms to support communication between the school and parents, and the list continues. The maps that we made were quite extensive. So school platforms are not a slick interoperable system. They're made up of more of a patchwork of platforms that are often incompatible, owned by, owned by a variety of tech firms and are often stitched together by a lot of human labor. So our inquiries um, revealed that staff and students don't really know where the data goes or how it's used. So as a first recommendation, schools need to be more on top of data privacy by better understanding where the school's data is stored, who owns it, how it's being used and for what purpose, and if it can be easily retrieved by the school if they want to look at it. So staff and students can make more empowered decisions this way around which data platforms they use and how they go about using them. So the second recommendation is to minimize unnecessary tracking and surveillance. So data analytic platforms have become an increasingly pervasive component of schools. And our research with the students and with the teachers, which I haven't presented on in this panel, found that they're not necessarily a constructive addition to the classroom. Um, our research revealed that students that are tracked don't feel the school trusts them. And I mentioned this earlier. So this compromises their experience and desire to learn. So the surveillance data gathered by these platforms is also of questionable accuracy or it's often decontextualized. So it takes time and human labor to sift through and utilize the data in a way that's valuable. So it's important to consider how a platform and the data gathered contributes to the broader experience and culture of teaching and learning in schools. The third recommendation is around data visibility and data literacy. And the last two panel members have really spoken about this, which is great. So one of the reasons we want automated systems is they do the work for us. However, in schools, the reality is that the automation in these platforms is only really useful to a point. In our three schools, there was always a human, usually a man who we refer to as the data guy with an extensive Excel spreadsheet, fixing up the data so it can be analyzed in a way that's useful for his particular school. So this is a very time consuming role and it means the power that data and information brings is concentrated to a few people within the school. So what we recommend is we develop platforms that are transparent in showing what they do, how the data is analyzed, the assumptions and decisions that are being made and the limitations that they have. So this transparency will enable all types of teachers and learners to be able to interact with them whilst building their data literacy. The fourth recommend recommendation is to really give students control over their profiles allow them to represent themselves their way. This may include access to the profile so they can add a pseudonym, change certain pieces of data such as their photo, so they better represent who they feel they are. We also may want students to choose which pieces of data are visible and which aren't. So for instance, some students expressed that they wanted their profiles to include their interests, so their online identity at school wasn't so schoolified. The final recommendation is to really make more use of data to help students learn. So as I mentioned previously, student data mostly includes assessment data in various forms, attendance data, which is used as a proxy for performance, and pastoral data. So this includes behavioral data and more sensitive data, such as students' health data. So students don't really have access to all this data. Teachers, teachers have access to some of this data, and if used, this data often becomes a prompt for conversation with a student. So a student will be flagged if they're missing class or their grades are failing. 
So the feedback we got from students was to shift away from what they saw as negative monitoring applications of data and instead consider more positive applications to support them learn. For instance, as part of this project, we developed a critical data literacy module for year nine students where they used and analyzed their own data to better understand the possibilities and limitations of this form of representation. So they're the five recommendations that I'll speak to um, and I'll stop there. I also wanted to include these references. Um, they really do speak to some of the articles. There's also a data website, which I'll include um, in the chat. I think I've just put it in the Q&A there as well. It's on the Data Smart Schools project. So thank you very much. Thank you, Browning. Very nice way to um, pro provide the recommendations with art. I love it. Vanessa, it's uh, your turn. Yeah. OK, so basically in line what was mentioned by Rowan, um, I just wanted to come up uh, with some ideas about the current limitations of these human-centered AI or learning analytics, because we have talked that uh, using co-designing participatory design processes to develop these solutions, it is a way to improve the adoption of these technologies. But actually, I think that this space, this co-creation, co-designing space, should be not just for designing different features of the tool or features of the interface we are providing to teachers or students. It is more about engaging them in conversations about data limitations, basically what, what, what Brown was mentioning, about the value of these technologies, about data privacy and sharing. It's how to put the learner and the teachers in the center so they can actually build these innovative solutions. And here I want to talk about like four current limitations, not just in terms of uh, the people that we are involved or engaged, but also in terms of the technology. We know that there are several data limitations. In my case, I work in this teamwork analytics in which we use a lot of uh, uh, data from multiple sources, and sometimes the system fails. So what happens when actually this system fails in the classroom? We are creating um, probably a, a technology that is not coming with the expectations of the teachers or learners. So we need to be able to come up with a solution that, okay, if something fails in the classroom, we are aware of that. And then next time you will be able to use that or you are able to use a product that uses incomplete data, because we know that not all data is complete when we build all these systems. The other point is about the uh, learning analytics value and adoption in the classroom. So only when you come at in, into a point in which you are in aligned with teachers' values, researchers' value, and designers' value, you will come up with a solution that will be um, to support the teaching or, or, and learning. And this is coming from an experience in, in a project that we are developing. We have been working in the nursing, uh, in the Bachelor of Nursing program for two years. And it has been up to after two years that we have finally released like a stable version of a learning analytics solution. And how this happened because they have seen all the process, all the co-design processes, all the process of developing this tool with all the ideas uh, that has uh, come up uh, with teachers and researchers and designers into this tool. So then now they are seeing this tool, um, this, the value of this tool and how it actually improves or supports the reflection uh, in nursing uh, teamwork development. The fourth point is about the power structures in the classroom, something that uh, um, it is a, a real thing uh, when we design these um, and we also implement these uh, tools. It is basically who is the one that will be using the tool. It is the teacher or the learner. But if it is the learner, we need to first come into the teacher because he will basically have the power to say to the learner, okay, this is useful for you, you can use it. And then there is like an actual, you know, um, adoption of the tool. 
So how can we design with that in mind that we as a researcher, designers, or developers of this learning analytics tool, we don't have like all the power to say to the students, okay, use this. We need to uh, talk with teachers. We need to engage with them and provide them with the real value of our technology. And finally, of course, uh, this is an ongoing topic about data privacy and sharing, in which in our case of Teamwork Analytics, you are showing data not just from one student, but from a team uh, of students at the same time. So we, are, we need to explore uh, how students want to uh, manage that part of uh, sharing information with others, sharing information in the classroom, but that is actually a limitation because if you want to develop a tool that could be available to everyone, we need to keep in mind that we should preserve that data privacy for one student, but also for all students. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Selena? Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I just wanted to talk through, um, I struggled to get this down to a list of five, um, but I'm going to try and stick to that um, in terms of the limitations. There's a lot, obviously, of work to do in this area. Um, and I just kind of want to talk through, I guess, some of the things that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. At the beginning, I said I'm a grounded researcher. I obviously have a hypothesis about the things that are working kind of on the ground and in schools. And I, I'm lucky, I feel like I'm lucky to be in a position where I get to synthesize those learnings and then hopefully share them with other educators in other sites. Um, for me, the first one, and, and I hope Simon, this goes part of the way towards answering your question that you posed on the low context and high context communication. I think one of the key limitations of this is at times there's a real desire for systems and schools to use data to the point where they they advocate for and they talk about being driven by the data or data driven. And I make a really clear distinction between being um, data informed versus driven, and we should always be advocating for being informed by the data and not driven by it. And so the challenge from a technology and an AI perspective is when insights are heavily just numerical or based on largely quantitative information, how do we keep teachers thinking about all of the other understanding of context of the young people, of the teaching team, of the demographics of the school and all of those other factors that hopefully sit really closely alongside the data to inform their decision making. I always say to educators, the data actually never tells us what we need to do. It's where we use the data plus our professional judgment to influence and inform the decisions that we make. And so when schools and systems have a focus on, I guess, using data and being driven by it, it's a, I think it's it's problematic, but it's also a really hard sell to people who actually got into this profession to make a difference in the lives of young people. And um, they didn't get into teaching to track kids in spreadsheets and use tech dashboards. So it's like, how do we kind of bring them into that and respect their professional judgment um, alongside these really important and influential uh, tech tools? The second thing, and it's kind of been touched on, but the importance of clean, valid and reliable data. We can't, we're not going to get buy-in into the tools that we're providing teachers access to if they don't actually trust the information that's coming out in the beginning. So when I, I often get people to stand on a continuum of one to 10 around how useful they feel data is in their classroom, I always get people standing at a number one saying they don't think it's useful at all. And when I ask them why, it's always to do with the validity and reliability of the information they're being given. So whether it's a teacher that doesn't trust the previous summative assessment results or feel like they're overly inflated, whether it's not necessarily feeling that a student is at a particular level in, say, a reading assessment, um, that almost, because they don't know enough about it, it, it almost kind of as a blanket perception of, oh, well, none of it's reliable then. And so we need to build better systems and structures that have better, cleaner, more valid and reliable information that's actually feeding this whole process in the first place. The third one for me, obviously, the current limitation is massively is massive around the skills and the gap. And in the chat, you know, there, there's I've been mentioning uh, that there's 
almost a spiraling increase in expectations on people to use data, but there isn't necessarily the support out there um, to, to walk alongside professionals in schools right now. So we know that many uni degrees now have got data and assessment subjects involved in them um, or included in them, which is awesome and a great step forward. Um, we need more than that. Um, when we're asking people to use this on a semi-regular or very regular basis, um, a six-month one subject course probably doesn't cut it at this point. I don't know what that looks like in the future, um, but it's just a challenge that I'm putting out there. The um, number four for me is around the, the challenge of the, of the tech companies and the internal development of tech solutions. And um, that's a conversation that I have weekly with schools around do we buy something off the shelf or do we spend the time and money on building something ourselves and obviously there are pros and cons of both of those um incredibly expensive um, to do kind of both options but again i would also argue that many of the tech if not all the tech platforms on the market at the moment are not perfect and so how do we kind of have that conversation with schools how do we get that the fact that it's not perfect and get that feedback back into the system so we can actually um, better meet the needs of the of the users at the other end and the final point as I kind of come to the end of my time Roberta I'm very aware of that is the um, and it's been mentioned but the absence of students in this whole process so schools are starting to is, um, engage students in having access to their own data. They've, um, in many schools, they've got logins to a dashboard that shows them longitudinal information about their performance. In the way that I talked about data storytelling with educators, there's also a massive piece around how do we actually have really good conversations with kids and with their parents and how do we build their capacity in engaging in the data storytelling piece as well. Thank you. Thank you, Polina. And um, finally, Lisa. Thank you, Roberto, and thank you, uh, fellow panelists, for uh, sharing all those challenges. So um, I'm just going to focus on three challenges. And I think, Selena, uh, some of my work ties uh, is similar to yours in, in terms of working with the educators. So what I'll do is I'm going to try and share um, from my own uh, from my own work, uh, working with teachers, some of the challenges that, that I see. So really starting first with, I'm going to start first with the challenge of showing impact. So the promise of you know, human-centered learning analytics is that it's supposed to address problems with implementation and take up that are associated with other design approaches. But what we're seeing is we're, we're missing that evidence, um, especially evidence of impact in the wild. Um, because in an authentic teaching and learning context, there are so many variables as we know. Um, and added to that, the implementation of a tool can be so contextualized, it's, it's actually quite hard to generalize that impact. Um, and that's also because these tools are really new. So drawing back to what uh, Vanessa has shared about all of the work that went into that teamwork analytics, how long did that take? You know, how much, how many uh, little projects were involved to make sure that that was a rigorous tool? Um, so tools like that and tools like Accurator and OnTask, they've been just they've just been through rigorous testing and refinement, and now they're ready to roll out as as tools to be used. But it's a long term process to get people on board with adopting these tools as part of that teaching. And so we're always starting off with working with the early adopters, and then it's the additional process of uh, sharing and disseminating those success stories to help others understand these tools and how they can benefit learning and teaching. Um, and then leads on to my second point, which is a little bit of the learning curve, especially with respect to data literacy. So, Selena, I hear you, you know, about um, uh, helping teach, uh, educators to understand uh, the data and um, really to, especially to see that, um, I guess, we, we need to contextualize that data and, and, understand, and make sense of it. So taking ONTAS again as an example, so I've shared just, um, previously that there's a lot of agency given to the academic in a number of ways, but this actually comes also with a trade-off uh, with respect to that data literacy. So just coming from my experience, I see the big challenge as how to segment the data into rules for meaningful feedback. So you have all that Canvas interaction data as numbers. 
how do you how do you pass that so that it's it's able to um, you know lead to meaningful messages of feedback for the students? So we need to foster also that responsible use of that agency. Um, it's encouraging to see that as, uh, as the academics continue to use the tool, they actually become more conversant with the data um, and thinking through it. So I especially remember one academic who I worked with who was grappling with how to use that LMS data for feedback. And after um, thinking through it, she realized that and, and this is just for her context. It wouldn't make sense for students to keep getting feedback about how they had engaged with the quiz. It would be repetitive and students would just switch off um, from the feedback. And so she, she began to realize that it may be better to report that as a pattern, a pattern of engagement and show that to students, give that to students as feedback um, and, and, and sort of give them advice around that pattern of engagement. So um, my last point uh, is um, coming back uh, to, I think to, um, I think it was what Vanessa or Selena was mentioned, oh no, um, Bronwyn was mentioning about the, the data guy. <laughs> so um, LA and I, uh, AI tools are largely developed by computer scientists and experts with backgrounds in machine learning, data wrangling, programming, coding. And on the other hand, um, educators have their domain knowledge as well as pedagogical knowledge. And we kind of need both to work together in order for LA and AI tools to be used purposefully and to be experienced meaningfully by students. So there needs to be that conversation between programmers and educators so that the use cases are really well understood and, and the programming makes sense. Um, I think one a good example of this is the uh, development and, uh, of AccuWriter. So I'm just going to pop a little um, uh, one of the uh, publications that talks about um, uh, the development of uh, AccuWriter and the whole process of co-design. So working really closely with the uh, with the academics to understand what exactly is you know reflective writing, what exactly is um, analytical writing, and what it will be the feedback that goes along with that um, for students. All right, and so that's what I'll end off with. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give the speakers a virtual applause because uh, yeah, they share all their awesome experiences um, that are, they are coming from different perspectives, but at the same time, there were so many points in common that they were um, emphasizing. Uh, so now I would like to open the floor to questions. There are some already in the Wuba uh, space, so I would encourage or participants to, if you have any questions, to pop it there. There's a Q&A section. Um, if it's too confusing, you can just put it here in Zoom and, and I can rephrase it or or just uh, speak it aloud. Um, so I, I would like to start with, with the questions, um, some questions that were posted here before the panel. And but I see that like some people were voting for it. So the first one is to anyone who wants to pick this question, could you recommend some existing frameworks for human-centered AI in education? Uh, I just answered that question in the chat. Um, one of the words that actually I like to read and reference in, in my publications is, is the word from Ken Holstein in which he talk about human AI adaptability, adapt, adaptivity um, in the classroom. So he proposes a, a different dimensions in how the human or teachers and students and how uh, intelligent tutoring systems could uh, both be situated in the classroom and how they work together and how different uh, strengths in terms of, of intelligence could be blended in an artificial intelligence tool. So I added the, the name of the paper and the authors in the chat. I hope, hopefully that would be enough. Yeah. Awesome, thank you, Vanessa. There is another question here, um, and again, it's 
for anyone in our panel. Um, and you can also respond it in however you, you feel you can respond it. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible that a virtual assistant or educational chatbot can help a teacher in their teaching activities? I can start saying something and there might be some other um, chat from the other panelists, but I think uh, in terms of the human centered element, um, part of what we were trying to do with our research is to understand what use data can have currently. So in terms of the teaching practices and what goes on in the classroom, the question I'd answer to ask to that question is why would they need that? What kind of potential, how would that improve what a teacher is doing? They are very skilled um, in being a teacher. And so thinking more about the benefit that that could bring in response to challenges they're experiencing. Um, and then thinking about the potential added work associated with using, managing, negotiating a chat box in the classroom um, or wherever else they're thinking about it. So just kind of thinking about the complexities and the different contexts and relations going on already at a school. Yeah, I just want to pick up on what Bronwyn has mentioned. Um, yeah, the key thing, um, remembering that it's human-centered. So um, I like what you said about um, what does the teacher intend to do with it? So this comes back to the point of what's the purpose? What is the purpose for the educator? And then how will it be meaningful for the student? So, um, you know, it, if the purpose of the educator is to just mainly um, unburden from certain workload, um, then I guess we need to think about uh, will that uh, will that allow them to also do the more complicated things to support students in more uh, in in the more complex support that they need, um, and always not forgetting that um, we. I guess relationships are really important for the um, for the student in in the educational setting. So, do we want to make sure that the chatbot um, does not take away that relationship between the student and the teacher, but somehow is able to foster it or augment it in some way? I was thinking when I read this question about how it would, would be used by a teacher outside the classroom, so prior, like during a planning kind of opportunity. And there's already kind of not, not chatbot facilities, but there are already, I guess, opportunities, say, in standardised assessments in Australia for you to look at some of the questions that your students have maybe potentially struggled with. And then there are associated or recommended resources that you could look at that are a bit below that level that might help develop that skill. Now, for a teacher to go and do that for their whole class right now, they have to know where to go. They need the time and space to kind of identify the, the gap or the low kind of area and then click through to the resource. So when I saw the question, I was thinking, well, if those, if those types of insights that, you know, if a teacher was able to say, this is the particular unit that I'm doing right now, and we had access to some really good data around student's ability in that area and then a chatbot AI app however you want to describe it was able to recommend or provide some ideas around activities that they could do to support students in that in that way then I would kind of say why not I completely agree with Bronwyn though the practicalities of actually having that running in a classroom I'm not I have no idea how that would actually look I'm not sure that I could cope with it but I still think that there's um yeah some potential there could I say one more thing about that? Because I think that's a really good point. And I can see um, Simon Atkinson's also mentioned that in the in the chat uh, to us. Um, this really speaks to issues that aren't that measurable, like trust. Um, so the perceptions students and teachers have around the um, introduction of AI into the school, their level of awareness, and it's really linked to their literacies as well, but the teacher's capacity to trust what recommendations this bot is bringing to them really will inform how they interact with it. Um, so thinking around uh, beyond the kind of accuracy or the, the potential application and think also considering the social element of how this bot might be introduced into a school context or beyond a, a classroom setting. So um, teachers can become more comfortable and also have a lot of agency over how the bot kind of responds and interacts with them. Great. Um, let's go to the next question. The next question is uh, from 
Jonan Donaldson, human center is related to the world of design thinking. And design thinking deals with wicked problems and wicked problems are emergent from complex systems. The question, the double question is, do you use complex systems theory? And if so, in what ways? That's a hard question, <laughs> I would say. Um, in my work, I haven't used any complex system theory, actually. What we're trying to do is to bring the practicalities of co-designing, participatory design into the complex scenario of teaching and learning, but um, I don't use any complex system theory. I think complex systems theory is grounded in a certain way of seeing things. I'm a qualitative researcher and our team did, we're social researchers, so we're more interested in the human experience of it, which doesn't really align with that type of theoretical approach. Okay, um, is there any last burning question from the audience? or anything that the, um, would like to be added by the speakers? We don't have any, any further question in the Booba platform, but if there is any final comment, we just have three minutes so we can um, start to wrap up and maybe um, have like our 30 seconds round of one line of, are related to human center learning analytics or human center AI in education? Sorry, I've always got so much more to say than I should. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think within the data in schools project, I'm not a data, um, critical data, scientist so this process to me has been really interesting in seeing how the conversation whilst being human-centered is still very much human-centered in relation to data how can we make data human-centered um so potentially flipping that to go hold on what is what is education what is teaching and learning and where is data really how can it be um in incorporated into this ecosystem these complex cities that are schools um, rather than looking at ways we can support teachers and students do data better. Um, that's one thing that kind of really came out from this study. There's different needs and motivations for data uses across different educational hierarchies. So something to think about. Thank you, Brian. Any final message, Vanessa? Yes, I think that current work in artificial intelligence in education has been in order to automate something, to support teachers, to support students, to do something, to learn something. But actually, I think that for future direction, I will think that we need to think about like how to give the teacher and the learners the agency to be um, capable of, you know, uh, being like empowering their learning basically like being self-regulated that being capable of saying okay this is what i want to learn and i will do this so they could take all the decisions in their learning thank you any final message Elena or lisa Yes, just to add, because uh, when Vanessa was speaking, it brought to mind um, this idea of professional development for human-centered AI and LA. I think that is a big gap at the moment. Uh, I remember uh, I was posed this question uh, in the course of my work. Will there always be the luxury of a researcher co-working with academics to implement or co-design the technology? universities don't always have the luxury of that extra resource. So this really means that um, uh, there's an important implication for um, you know, uh, being able to upskill um, educators uh, in real settings. You know, how do we design professional development so that, um, so that these educators can use the tools in their own and, and innovate perhaps even the way that they use them? 
Thank yeah, you. I was going and to say close of the panel. Yeah, Selena. <laughs> sorry, I was going to say a very similar thing, Lisa. How do we bridge that gap between research and practice, which I know has a, been an ongoing conversation for decades? But the other, the other key kind of player in this are the technology companies who are often only responding to what the users want when they're getting multiple requests for a similar thing and therefore can just the, um, justify the financial investment in doing so. Um, we've kind of, I reckon we've got it the wrong way around. How do we actually bring people and research into this process to build some really great stuff from the beginning um, and then be responsive to their needs as we progress? Thank you. And thank you so much for all the attendees, uh, more than 80 attendees in this panel. Thank you to our, to our speakers. Thanks for sharing your experiences. Um, I, I, I'm sure that we all learned something in this panel. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely day, evening, night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Good to see you again, Aurora.